Well, we were told to, uh, we were put on a train from uh, the Assembly Center, and I clearly remember um, on the train, the, G the MP would tell us to pull down the shades, and they didn't want us to be looking outside the window. And we were transported this way, and it was uh, two days and, and, and a night before we arrived to um, Idaho camp. Uh, you know, I, I find it a real privilege to be talking about Marianne Kanemoto because when I first met her, I heard her incredible story of how she was sent back to Japan as a teenager and the journey that she herself took. She was on the Grisholm, which was a Swedish line, and she talks about uh, she expatriated because that was her father's decision, and then the, in India, was where the prisoner exchange took place. And she said the minute they got onto that, or s very soon after they got onto the ship from Japan, they knew, our father said, we made a mistake. Her story is very unique in that when it came time for the redress mo movement, she was deemed ineligible because she repatriated. But Marion in her, you know, even though she's humble, she also understands right and wrong and stands up when it needed to. And she said, I was a minor. I didn't have a decision. I'm not alone in this. I'm going to fight. And she went to the Department of Justice and they did an investigation. And they said, you're right, you are eligible. And because of her work, other Japanese American Niseis found themselves uh, the beneficiary of her hard work. Later, she worked as a school nurse in the Elk Grove Unified School District. And even today, 2017, I still run into people that say, whatever happened to your friend, Marion Kanemoto? She was such a wonderful school nurse. I will always remember her. So 20 years after she retired, she made such an impression that people still remember her. And I not only remember her, but I honor her for the legacy that she has left. You know, she took over as chairman of the Oral History Project uh, with Joanne Idetani after my mother couldn't do it anymore. Marion had the foresight uh, to realize the importance of capturing the history of the Japanese and Japanese Americans in the Florin area. And she also realized the urgency of capturing uh, these history because uh, the East Days were, you know, rapidly passing on. Two things. One, it is a legacy, but it also helped the people that were being interviewed to be able to tell their stories. For, for a long time, nobody, you know, they, they weren't important. And all of a sudden, somebody came and said, we want to tape your story. We want to take your story down. Well, for years, uh, Marion opened up her house to uh, assemble the pages of the typed oral history. So everyone on the committee, there were a bunch, more than a dozen, I think, uh, we would go to her home and um, do the work. Every single uh, space on her table was stacked with with oral history papers. As I had said previously, the oral histories are, I say, one of the most uh, heavily used collections. Actually, I think it is the most heavily used. Uh, in the past, our usage statistics have proven that that's the case. Scholars from literally all over the country, all over the world, were saying, um, you know, interlibrary loan them. Uh, one went, I think, to somewhere in Sweden uh, uh, they wanted to read them, so I said, interlibrary loan if you're associated with the university. It's a cliche, but it's the truth. History does repeat itself. Um, and it's not just the story of the abrogation of constitutional rights. It's the story of starting over in a new country. It's the story of assimilating. It's a story of racism. It's a story of perseverance. It's 
the American story of you want to do better for their children. And I see the Niseis and the Sanseis have risen to the highest echelons of profession and community. It is truly the story of America and it's a story that people throughout the world strive for. I would compare her to um, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, and there were many others. Uh, can't think of offhand, but she just was, uh, is a, a wonderful individual to have as a friend. And I'm very grateful that um, she is a friend of mine. That's excellent. Thank God for that. <laughs> First of all, I must say I am grateful and humbled to be at this gathering of fellow JCLers two of their honorees and friends. And I appreciate this honor very much. Thank you. At my age, memory can get a little fuzzy, but I do remember the Florence JCL Oral History project that I was involved in. We started about 30 years ago, 1987 to 88, and ended in 2003 or so. I remember obtaining guides and instructions for doing oral histories as given at the CSUS classes. Briefly, the project required tape recording, interviewees, interviewers, transcribing from, from tape to scripts, some translating from Japanese to English, a lot of typing, photographing, and publishing. The project was successful with teamwork among the many team members who were so generous and helpful. So the honor belongs to them as well. Working with them was productive and pleasurable and memorable. So in closing, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all the team and members too. Thank you all very much. <laughs>